But uh, I, I felt the Lord say this to me this morning. That um, it's really, really, he's been saying a lot. <laughs> but this is, this is really interesting. Um, do you know every day starts off for everybody like that? Okay? It's a blank sheet. That's a better one. All right. What happens to that blank sheet is what you do with it. Isn't that right? So if you have a to-do list, that turns that blank sheet into purpose. Now what I felt the, the Lord say this morning is religion does something to us. And what, I talk, what I'm talking about, religion is not doing good works of righteousness, it's that spirit that comes upon so many people around the world, and the Christians, and there's religion in, in every form of, of uh, worship around the world, of all the different things. This all becomes religious. There's this, this thing that happens, and what it does to people is this. So that's how you start, and then over a period of time, this starts to happen to your mind. It's this thing, right? And then, and that's what happens to a person, they get bound in religion. Alrighty? And nothing happens. And so they enter into a life of frustration and futile works. That is not our call, but it can happen to us. Okay. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You see, every day, it doesn't matter what happened yesterday, in one respect, because of the consequences, but what happened happens today is what we make happen and I've just had it on my heart for uh, about a month now a little bit over a month and I was I was just saying here got, Lord we're going to come into the Christmas period again and you know it's just really not a great time of the year for the church it just, just disrupts everything and the finances crash and people just take off in all directions it's like you know, for a month, there's an exit stage left. You know, we used to see on cartoons when I was a boy. And some silly thing would just leave and go left. And uh, that's what seems to happen. And, and what I was really feeling was we, we, we need to connect with some of the things we do. And that's why we've, we're sort of looking at this whole area of, of Melchizedek. Now, what I'm wanting you to understand is I know, I know you don't know, but I know, that this is exactly what the Lord wants us to do. Because I was walking around my shed trying to get a, a, a leverage on how do, you, how do we break into this in a way that's meaningful, challenging, but positive. Okay? And I was, had this thought that was sort of floating in my head, not connecting to anything really, but that we're to, we're to get a hold of a principle here a reality in our tithing. Because I don't believe that we've come into that place where we want to be. Would that, would that be true? Do you know you've been so faithful in your tithes over the years and, and I, it's just so many people are like this. But there's not that sort of expected return happening. And I don't think we quite understand the dynamics of what tithing is supposed to be it's become a religious experience for so many of us. And we just, every Sunday, put our money in. And a lot of you started off in church, your, your, your Christianity in a church denomination, and they had different ideas. And, and, and some of the really big churches, when offering time comes, you hear the tinkle of coins. You know? Well, what does that mean? Well, just putting coins in there. That's as good as it gets. And that's about as much as the return is, too. That is not what the Lord is intending. So I'm thinking about this and saying, Lord, what do, how do I do this? 
how do I make this uh, a challenging word that's not manipulative, that's liberating? Not manipulative, liberating. It is so easy for people to get offended when you teach about offerings and tithes and things like that. And I know I'm probably talking to the converted here, but what I'm wanting to do is put some oomph into it by the Spirit so that when you tithe, this is not just uh, an exercise in futility for you. This is not just a, uh, a thing that I'm supposed to do, but I really don't want to do it. Or, which is probably the lowest rung on the ladder, I can't afford to do it. Okay, now these are all things that are real in this realm. So I'm thinking and mulling over this and I'm in the shed at our place and if you go into that place, I think Miranda best described it, she walked in there, tried to find something and just walked straight out. <laughs> she had no idea where it was. And I've got no, stuff has just been moved and it's all over the place. It's, and the things are in boxes and I don't, and, and the kid stuff's in there and they go rummage through everything and everything just gets, it's just frustrating. <laughs> anyway, I'm just standing there praying to the Lord because that's where, where I go to pray a bit. And um, I just, just like this. And I just walked over to this plastic container underneath uh, uh, some other containers and behind some other containers. So it really wasn't, and I didn't even know what was in it. So I went in there and said, oh, okay. So just shalamundering away, praying in tongues, shalamanda, praising the Lord and just praying. And, and I start to pull the stuff away and I, I open it up and, and then, and I just see this book. Oh, I said, what's that? So I opened it up and I looked at it. Now this is a book by Maurice Cerullo. I don't know how many people know Maurice Cerullo. Anybody know, heard of Maurice Cerullo? Okay, he's one of the, the he's, he's an old man now, but his ministry still goes on. He's one of the original big guys who are out there in the, in the 50s and 60s and that preaching the gospel all over the world and, and Asia. And he's, he's got a great ministry. And I, I got this book, Spiritual Warfare Financial Classic. I didn't even know I had it. I didn't even know it was there. I'm serious. What is this? I'm, I've, I've obviously bought it and I've totally forgotten about it. But um, this is written, uh, copyrighted 1998. So it's, you know, this writing when I, when I started to read it, it's all about the coming of the new millennium and uh, the expectation of the Lord to return uh, pretty soon. Now here we are, 2018, wondering what happened to all this stuff, you know. But... What I was mulling in my spirit, how do I connect to fact that your tithes is being ministered and given to our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ? So I picked it up. When I picked it up, I opened it up just here. And the heading of this is, Christ, our high priest, receives our tithes and presents them to God. And this is a chapter on this and on Abraham, and then it all started to start flooding back to me. But the, the thing, what I'm wanting to say to you, I wasn't looking for this book, I didn't even know I had it. But in my spirit, I felt this. How do, how do we connect with this whole sense of tithing to Jesus? We're giving it to Jesus. You're not giving it to me. You're not... Um, it's amazing how many people are going to sleep. Now, I would have found this interesting. But this, this is what we're fighting against. This is life and death stuff for all of us. This is what we've we're, we're got to understand, that things changed at Calvary. But so many of us have got into the old Levitical priesthood style. You'd come up to the, the, uh, the tabernacle or you come up to the temple and you put them in the box and you just go away. But what we don't realise is that everybody was doing it and this was a massive party. Because people were coming from all around the nation to give their tithes. And on the feast days and on all these sort of things, this wasn't just people coming up one time, plonk and walk away, like so many offering things are that you see. 
This is a whole bunch. The, the clans are coming together, the families are coming together and people are rejoicing and there's timbrels and guitars and a whole ball of wax is going on because they're bringing their tithes unto the high priest. He takes them and then he offers them up to God as a priestly ministry. Now what's happened to us, we don't realise that because we've never seen it. So we've got to get a picture from this Holy Spirit and that's where this Melchizedek teaching comes from. Because it is just right out from where we're comfortable. And a lot of people don't even realise that Melchizedek's in the Bible, let alone what he stands for. So last week we, 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 we cracked the ice and we went for it. And we started talking about it. And uh, interesting comments from it all, all positive. That, uh, basically that, oh, I didn't know who he was. You know, and, and these things that we read in the Bible and we just gloss over them. But what I want to just uh, speak to you about now is Christ, our high priest, receives our tithes. So we go to Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 again. And I'm just picking out things. We're not doing this thoroughly. It's just to, to um, encourage you in this um, pretty daunting period of time in which we all live at the moment, and that's called Christmas. And uh, that's the time of great expense for everybody. And if you, re if you recall what I was talking about last week, is, is let's be positive in our giving uh, rather than be negative that we're giving away our money. It's my money. And I'm giving it to a lot of people who I really don't want to give it to because why should I? You know, all these things that can come into our or come from our heart. But what I read was in Genesis chapter 14. After the, the battle of the kings that Abraham won and set Lot free, his nephew free, and took all the bounty, he's just going along wherever he was going. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he, Abraham, gave him a tithe of all. Now what I wanted you to understand last week was basically, this is the beginning in a, clar a real clarity of, of, of scripture about tithing. And it comes from this mysterious person called Melchizedek. We talked a little bit about him. And we can't go into, I'll have to go into this properly in the new year because this is really exciting, dynamic stuff if you'll apply it in the spirit. But what I'm wanting you to understand is this. Right from here, we see the prophetic concepts of salvation coming into play through this meeting of Abraham, who becomes Abraham by covenant, and also Melchizedek who's the king of Salem, the king of peace, and then Hebrews identifies him as the king of righteousness. So here we have peace and righteousness, the king of peace and the king of righteousness. Now what does that mean to us? Not a whole lot, because our king and queen are, are just uh, symbols. You know, or our king, our queen is a symbol. She holds no power really and she just looks good. And her son or her grandson coming up to be the future king, he'll have no power. So they're just symbols. And when you look around the world at all the kings and queens around who are left, they're basically symbolic. There's nothing symbolic about what we're involved in. You must get this. You must understand this. That the king of righteousness means he is king of righteousness over everything. Righteousness is over all. He is the king of righteousness. Despite what we're seeing going on in our community, despite the rejection of the Lord, despite all the horrible things that are taking place, he is still the king of peace and the king of righteousness. He is Lord of all. And everything with God starts at righteousness. Unless you're born again, you cannot get into the kingdom of God. That's where it starts. So here we are looking at this event here. Now, the thing I wanted to just quickly look at, we, we had communion last week and we talked a little bit about this, but then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. 
Now, the, the, the point I'm wanting to sort of challenge you with this morning is, you, is to try and get something really serious across to encourage you. You see, so much of what we go through, we, get, we feel we're alone, we're on our own, um, there's nobody to help, and all these sort of things. But when you see bread and wine, we're, we're looking at something really profound. Now, I just make reference to this comment last week from one of, one of the things I downloaded, which is really, I think, great. A vital principle to remember concerning the Old and New Covenants is that what did not originate in the Old Covenant did not die with it. In other words, what's in the Old Covenant, which is, we talked about being the Mosaic Covenant, the bells and the smells and the incense, the nonsense and all the stuff that went on there, okay, that died. But what I was wanting to show you was that this, this encounter, Abraham with Melchizedek, was 430 years earlier. So it's not part of the Old Covenant. Do you understand? And so when you go on the internet and start looking into these stuff, you're going to get a lot of misinformation. Right? Just, 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 just they don't know what they're talking about. Or, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm pretty serious about what I'm saying here, we had a friend in, in, in Tasmania who used to be an SAS guy, a commander, and he said one of the very efficient ways that the enemy infiltrates its target, the, the, the people or the government that wants to overthrow, is by infiltrating and setting up what he calls misinformation. And they put a little bit of misinformation and then you build upon that misinformation. And we're seeing that in our political arenas now. There's a whole lot of different concepts. And the enemy puts in something, a lot of truth, but there's an error there. And he builds upon the error, combining it with the truth. Everybody accepts the truth and tags us with it. But over a period of 20 years, they build the misinformation area and keep the truth, but the misinformation area has all this error in it, and people believe it. And then they can hit, and then things change for the worse. So that's one of the things that's happening on the internet with Christian values and the things that you read there. Unless you really study this stuff properly, through the hermeneutics and comparing scripture with scripture, letting the, the Bible interpret itself, not what people think, because Melchizedek does, just does not define normal. Okay? It's supernatural and, and he's an amazing person <laughs> in the natural, let alone being the Lord Jesus Christ. Alrighty, now what I wanted to show you this was in the Garden of Eden, what was the command? Don't eat the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the only command, you see, that the Lord put on Adam and Eve. They could have everything. So what I want you to understand is that the principle of tithing, the principle of submitting to the word of God was initiated in the Garden of Eden was Adam and Eve. So important because we think these are modern concepts, but it was right there in the beginning. What, did I, what happened there? God said, you can have anything. You have to look after the tree because they were to tend everything, weren't they? They were to work and do the stuff that they had to do there. So you got this tree and then they weren't to eat the fruit. So out of their work, there was a portion that they couldn't touch. Or I shouldn't say that, that they couldn't eat, consume. Now that's what I regard as a type for tithing, because there's a part of your income that the Lord requires. Now we go, oh, why does he do that? Well, gee, you know, where were you going before you found out this? You know, where were you going, guys? You're going to hell, weren't you? Fast track, if you were me, full, flat out, going to hell. So what's a tithe when that's the alternative? So that's how we've got to think. Hang on. Just because things are a bit tough, that doesn't mean I don't do what should be done. But what's lacking is the faith in what you're doing. And that's, that comes because of revelation. And revelation comes through the knowledge of the word. God, the, You need gospel faith. You don't need human faith. You need gospel faith. And faith from the gospel. Yeah. 
comes from the gospel, the good news. It's not, it's not just repent and get saved. It's, it's the good news of the whole blessing that God's provided for us. So we see that, that in the, in the Garden of Eden, there it is, the principles established, and Adam and Eve had to submit to that. And that's how God is able to prove who we are. He knows, but he likes to show us so that we know. Because we don't know. Half the time we're walking around the fog. All righty? It's just so much stuff's going on at the moment. All right, could you please put up that table, please, mate? All righty. Well, here we go. Lift her up. Supplemental three. Covenant chart. What I wanted you to understand is this language that uh, Melchizedek is talking to Abraham is covenantal language. So what we have, can, you, can that go up higher, mate? Get, get, get all this up? Oh, that's it. Thank you. So we've got historical Genesis 14, Melchizedek with Abraham. This is where the Abrahamic covenant comes in. We have the bread and the wine, tithes, blessing, Melchizedek, king and priest. Okay? So here's before. Let's say this is after Adam and Eve came out of the garden. Alrighty? So you had the Edenic covenant, you had the Adamic covenant, and you had the covenant with Noah. Okay? So they're all over here somewhere. Then you come through to Calvary. All right? So you've got the Abrahamic covenant coming through David, through here, and then we're into the new covenant. And then we're into the millennium. So this is where we're going. This, this stuff's got to come. It's futuristic. And then there's eternity. So... This is not the end, this is the beginning for us. Okay, don't you? You've got to realize there's a hope, there's a confidence. We're going somewhere which is absolutely extraordinary. So, here, Abraham, then we have David covenant, New Testament, you've got the new covenant, basically the Mosaic covenant. What have you got? You've got Abraham, Mosaic covenant, bread and wine, table of showbread, tithes, tithes and offerings, blessing, blessing or cursing. Things changed a little bit. People becoming more responsible. Why? Because God's teaching people about sin. The Ten Commandments is to show the people, his family, what sin is, what is acceptable to God, what is not acceptable to God. They just didn't have the inner workings, the inner ability to obey God. Okay? So that's why they had the priesthood, the Aaronic and Levitical priesthood. So there was this was established first. Then this came in because these guys have spent a long time in Egyptian slavery and had come into all of that. And then we come through that Mosaic Covenant in the, uh, that 1,500-year period to this crucifixion, which nobody knew about, only the Godhead. Nobody understood this at all. Now, what happened here... In Hebrews 5, 6, 7 and 8, and this is the fallacy of this argument that this is not new, that tithing is not in the New Testament. This is all to do with, the book of Hebrews is all to do with Melchizedek, who is Jesus Christ. How, how, how can't that be New Testament? The principles, the whole thing, we'll have to open this up later, but we're just touching on it today. Abraham, Moses, New Covenant, bread and wine, table of showbread, the Lord's table. What did we celebrate? Bread and grape juice. Sorry, but bread and wine, you know? Bread and grape juice. All righty? Tithes. Tithes and offerings. Tithes and offerings. It's all in it. It's all part of the deal. Blessing. Blessing or cursing. Blessing available. Melchizedek. Aaron. Jesus. See? Jesus. Jesus. They call this a Christophany. Okay? Jesus appearing pre his incarnate form. Everlasting covenant, 430 years. You've got the temporary covenant of Moses and all the other ones that are in there. Palestinian covenant. Come back. Everlasting covenant. Christ and his church, the royal priesthood. See? Guys, that's you. This is huge. We haven't taught on it much. We've just a little bit here, a little bit there. But you're that. You're a royal priesthood. 
You've been born again. You have the DNA of Jesus Christ. That's you. Tithes and offerings are not uh, a pain. Tithes and offerings are an investment into your future. It's a way that the Lord has to keep us keeping ourselves. We're naughty. Has anybody ever found that out? That every now and then you get a bit naughty. You just don't want to do it anymore. You just want to do what you want to do. Well, that's what Adam and Eve did. And it only took one. This is what we don't get. Sin and God do not exist together. If God turns up, psst, everything goes. That's why God said, I can't come and visit you, Moses. You'll die. And Moses says, Lord, I've got to see your face. I've got to see your face. No, no, if I come and see you and say, hi, you're dead. Do you understand that? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They fall short. Why? Because everybody has sinned. And through God's mercy, he, he's up there. He's, there's a break between us. But if he comes here because and wants to give you a hug, because so many people want a hug from the Lord, don't they? You know, yeah. Well, if you turn up, you know, you're a, you're a French fry, baby. <laughs> Not now because you're saved, but, you know. So many people, oh, God, come and help me. If you turned up, you're dead. So he gets us to turn up. We've got to turn up under his leading, under his unction, carrying in us heaven. Now, I'm really flying over this stuff. I'm just wanting to just put something out here. And we'll do it properly because the more I've been talking about this, the more I'm suddenly realising that this is really huge and we need to do it properly. But the thing is, what is a covenant? Okay. Some more of Kevy's heavy revies. Thank you, Kevin Connor. I had no idea about any of this until I found him. Okay, now listen to these words, please. In every case in Scripture... When a covenant was instituted between God and man, God is seen as the initiator. It's not a good idea for us to have a good idea about the covenant. It's his idea. What we think has to match up with what he's saying. God is seen as the initiator. Man did not come to God with a proposal seeking God's approval. Rather, God came to man declaring his will and seeking man's adherence. This is the serious part of this morning. A covenant is a contract between God and man drawn up by God and presented to man. We can't do this. And all of these covenants, when they came, it was the God's idea was to create Adam and Eve. It was God's idea to, to save them. And so we have the Adamic covenant. Then we have the failure of mankind, the history of all of that. And then we've got Noah. And Noah was the only family. And look at them, what a state they were when they finally got beached and, and got going. And Well, they really brought out the fruit of the old covenant, didn't they? Just fallen man. So God initiated another covenant. He reached down. They didn't know what to do. And then Abraham, God moves in here. Wow, he's going to start a whole thing again. How's he going to do that? Through an old man. He doesn't look too old to me now. You know, he's 75. That's not too old. See, anyway, you didn't get it, did you? <laughs> there we go, Abraham. And then Moses' covenant. And then finally Jesus comes in. Now, it starts off in Eden and goes through to Jesus. But all of this is really part of what is called the everlasting covenant. But what am I saying here is that it's God's idea and God reached down to save us. We didn't reach up to him to be saved. And he'll only save us in his covenantal way. And if we don't obey the covenant of God, we're trying to do it ourselves. And that's what all these other things are doing. All these other religions around the world, all these other belief systems and all this stuff is man trying to find God. We are the most blessed and wonderfully blessed people on the earth. Because God has reached down to you and said, I'm saving you. Do you want it? There are people doing extraordinary things out there trying to find salvation. And they're just bashing their head against a brick wall. This is too simple. 
All I have to do is believe. And with tithes and offerings, that's all we have to do, is believe that what we're actually doing, we're ministering into the Melchizedek covenant. We're a priest of the order of Melchizedek. What does that mean? Whatever Melchizedek could do, we're a priest of that. What does that mean? You can manifest the priestly attributes of Melchizedek, of Jesus Christ, because you're part of the priesthood of Jesus Christ. You're the one who can hand out the holy things. And tithing's a part of that. Giving's a part of that. Tithing is giving. We're giving to God that which he gave to us. Healing. He's given that to us. And we're giving that to other people and to ourselves. That's part of the priestly ministry that's available when you read the, and study the priest and what they were supposed to do. They were to train the people on what they were to do. They were to minister the healing things. Remember Jesus said, go and find the priest, go to the temple and, and, and do what the priest tell you to do to get your healing. But now you're not somebody stuck away in a little tribe that can, can't own anything. See, the Levitical priests couldn't own anything. The people gave the tithes so that they could be paid. Here, we give our tithes to our high priest and we can go and make money too. You can live a life, but you're a priest at the same time. You're not tied down to any specific thing. God's got a place for you to go, for you to function, for you to make an income. But he requires his tithe of it so he can bless you in it. So you can release kingdom life, not earthly life. And kingdom life comes from the king. And that life comes through certain requirements. And that's the covenant. And we adhere to it because it's blood bought. God paid for it himself. And if he loves you that much, surely he's going to answer your prayers. And you've, that's what you've got to be. You've got to look at this stuff. Hang on, I'm being hoodwinked here. I'm feeling sorry for myself. But that, I, I, there's no reason to. I don't know what to do. Well, he does. You're not alone. So guys, as we, as we sort of conclude here, and now we get into the Christmassy stuff, um, I just really felt that that was an introduction to what I think we've, we've, we've got to get into next year because this is so important that you see yourself as a priest of God as well as a king. You're a king over the affairs of life, but you're a ministry to people. You're not a king over people. You're not a tyrant to tell them what to do. But to the devil you are, because he's under our feet. And then you minister to the Lord, and what does the Lord do? Every indication in the Bible shows us as we minister to him, he ministers to us. This morning he came here, his presence was here. We just want to love you, Lord, and you can feel it all over you. Well, I could anyway. You know, it's just wonderful. The music team up there playing for us, I can't play a thing. And here I just come here once a week and just, well, I can just get lost in the praises of my Lord and, and these wonderful musicians just up there doing their thing and wow, and it's free. Amen? Your tithe is really important for you. God owns everything. He doesn't need it. We need it. We need to be able to give it so we can connect to his priesthood. Investing in him so that we can be blessed in return. We're investing. We're actually paying honour by giving him a gift. You know, you just can't go to a king empty-handed. The convention of palaces is you bring a gift. All righty? What are you going to give the Lord? A gift of praise. A gift of worship. A gift of a life style, a gift of sacrifice only because it's hurting us but it should be a, a, a planting of life, I'm giving you my life Lord to receive your life in return and that's so important for you this Christmas you're giving yourself to people you're going to be visiting people, you're going to be seeing people give them the life of Christ that's living in you by your demeanour by your words, by your hug or your kiss on the cheek or whatever you do, you know, to say hi. 
Why? Because that's him in you ministering to them. And pray for them before you see them. Give to them what has been given to you, the love of God. Amen? Amen. Okay, God bless you.